Hello, I'm Carol Ann Riddell, and welcome to a special edition of Simply Science, Oceans in Crisis. Today, we have an in-depth interview with an expert on that topic, explorer and environmental advocate, Fabian Cousteau. But first, Barry Mitchell explains why we can no longer take our oceans for granted. Why should we care about the ocean? Oceans cover two-thirds of the Earth's surface. And did you know oceans provide 50% of the world's oxygen? Oceans are a source of food, trade, and recreation. Worldwide, three billion people make their living from marine-related industries. The biggest threat to our oceans is us. Our carelessness, thoughtlessness, and neglect. Like using the ocean as a garbage dump for things we can't see, and things we can't see, like chemicals, biological toxins, microscopic metals, and microplastics. We're literally getting ourselves in hot water. Climate change is the gradual long-term shift in temperatures and weather patterns caused by human activities, like the burning of fossil fuels. The oceans are absorbing more heat, resulting in massive melting of glaciers, resulting in rising sea levels, resulting in catastrophic events like Hurricane Sandy in 2012, which caused $60 billion of flood damage to New York City. Rockaway was one area especially hard hit. Warmer oceans are incubators for toxic algae called sargassum, a floating, poisonous seaweed that leaches oxygen from the ocean, creating dead zones that kill off marine life. Tons of this smelly, oily algae wash up every spring on beaches in South Florida and the Caribbean coast, harmful to the local ecology and an expensive headache for the tourism industry. We New Yorkers pride ourselves on surviving and thriving in the urban jungle. But the five boroughs are surrounded by over 500 miles of coastline. Our coastal waters are part of us. Ocean conservation is an urban issue. His family name is synonymous with ocean conservation. I recently spoke with explorer and environmental advocate Fabian Cousteau. Fabian is the grandson of Jacques Cousteau, whose television series, The Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau, helped introduce the public to the beauty and mystery of our oceans. And Fabian continues that legacy today. I asked him if New Yorkers need to adjust the way we think about our oceans, starting right here at home. Manhattan is an island. Staten Island is an island. And in any borough you go, you have a, a beautiful shoreline and a shoreline that is interactive with uh, our livelihoods and mm -hmm. what we depend on. In terms of safety, what is at stake here in New York if we don't take those issues seriously? Well, everything from food security to uh, the erosion of our shorelines, uh, so property damage and potentially even loss of life as we saw with Superstorm Sandy and, and other uh, natural disasters. Yeah, let's talk about Hurricane Sandy a little bit more. And we all remember, gosh, the devastation of that situation. To what degree does climate change play a role in that kind of damage and devastation? Oh, it plays a fundamental role. It's, it, it's the epicenter of what uh, creates the barometer of life on this planet. So the ocean and climate change are interrelated and the dynamics that happen between those two things are what we see as a result of storms like Sandy. Uh, when you boil water, water expands and so on and so forth. On a much smaller scale, uh, in terms of temperature, that's what's happening to our oceans. Uh, things get much more um, violent, unpredictable. But beyond this, it's also the weather patterns, right? Okay. Climate change uh, creates inconsistencies in our weather patterns that are much less predictable. And so if we're not prepared, that's when we start being caught with our proverbial pants down, and that's where you see a lot of damage and potentially loss of life. And our oceans do have a role in terms of those weather patterns. Our ocean is our, uh, it's our universal connector, right? It is the living thing that determines what kind of weather patterns we have because it is subject to things like climate change. So it reacts in a very organic way to climate change related issues. So it, sort of as a, as a regulating factor? It's a barometer, yeah. if you will. A the barometer. ocean is our, is our barometer. Um, if you see tsunamis, uh, that's an interaction between uh, underwater earthquakes and 
water, right, our ocean. Mm -hmm. creates those, those waves, those surges. If you see something like a storm or a hurricane or uh, an El Nino event, uh, in the case of the Pacific, uh, those are dynamic interactions between uh, weather or, or climate getting warmer mm -hmm. and the ocean reacting to that. And so between that and the rising sea levels, which are also interrelated, we're seeing uh, greater erosion in places like Florida, uh, in the Northeast, like New York City, mm -hmm. uh, and in other places around the world, including island nations that are completely being wiped out and displaced because their country will no longer exist in 20 to 50 years. In a place like New York City, Fabian, what could we be doing differently or what are we doing to protect against that? Not enough. Hmm. We're not doing enough. The ball is in motion. And the only way to slow that pattern down is to curtail some of the issues that we as home, at home, being decision makers, um, are partly responsible for. So fossil fuels, of course, everyone talks about fossil fuels. That's, that's an issue right there. Mm -hmm. And as consumers, we're filling the bucket with our decisions, right? One way or another, good decisions, bad decisions. Eating uh, livestock, right? Meats, especially uh, cows, things like that. Uh, are a part of this issue. Now, to take it on a much uh, grander scale from the individual to the community, the U.S. is 5% of the world's population consuming over 20% of the world's resources. Which is really quite a statistic. So we are much more powerful in our decision-making processes as individuals and as communities. So the more we make better decisions in our everyday lives, the more impactful we are in a positive way against combating things like climate change. Where would we be if our oceans continue to suffer? Well, what would this place look like? It's a very interesting question and, and certainly one that requires a very long philosophical debate. Uh, but let me put it this way. Without ocean, there is no life on this planet. When you talk to an astronaut or a space agency, what are they looking for? They're looking for water on other planets. We live on this gorgeous oasis in space. So the way we treat our life support system, the ocean, is the way we treat ourselves and our future. If we keep using it as an endless resource in a garbage can, we know where we're headed, right? We're headed to ex extinction. Let me, let me suggest one thing, a very simple thing. For any species on this planet to survive long term, there are three basic natural rules that species follow. To evolve, to adapt, and to diversify. If we can use those three basic approaches in our trajectory in life, we have a much better chance at surviving long term. Wow. Well, that, it, it, is, it is scary to think about. <laughs> How worried are you? Well, you know, at the end of the day, the planet doesn't care one way or another whether we're here or not, right? It, it, it will do what it needs to do. Science is science. Facts are facts. Uh, and so how worried am I? Um, I'm, I'm rather terrified at the idea that my child will inherit a planet that is devoid of life, that is devoid of joy, uh, that is devoid of, of diversity. Uh, and that's all in our hands as adults and as young adults uh, at this stage in life. We've had these debates for decades, right? The modern era of exploration of science knows where we're headed. And it's up to us to make a better set of decisions so that our children can benefit from those things that we've always enjoyed. Right, we are going to take a quick break and we will be right back. Welcome back. We are talking with ocean explorer and conservationist Fabian Cousteau. So Fabian, let's walk through some of the ways that our oceans are threatened. We hear a lot about three big ones, um, specifically, of course, climate change, pollution, and overfishing. What do we mean by overfishing? Well, those are the three dark horsemen, as I like to call them, mm -hmm. because they're, they're, they're showing us the way to the apocalypse, right? Uh, overfishing. Overfishing is a fairly complex topic, but one that's simplified by saying that we're basically clear-cutting the ocean, 
right? We're fishing out everything, uh, not really targeting species. We're scraping the bottom. We're destroying the environment under water. And that result is uh, illustrated by the numbers of wild fish stocks that are left. We've fished since the industrialization of fishing practices since the late 1950s. Yeah. Wiped out over 60% of our world's wild fish stocks. When you look at pelagics, meaning the traveling animals, the billfish, the shark, the tuna, the, the large animals that are going, we're down to less than 10% of those wow. original numbers. So that should be alarming because if we look at this as a natural resource bank account, we're going bankrupt very quickly and there is no bailout loan. Yeah. Now, the little light at the end of the tunnel is that we've also seen that if you create marine protected areas that are respected, right, that are off limits, that are hope spots by, uh, by Sylvia Earle's definition, those are places that can repopulate and they spring out and overcrowd themselves and then have a spillover effect which is beneficial to the fishermen and so on and so forth. But we need to be able to do that to the tune of 30% or more of our oceans. In, in terms of pollution, I read a terrifying statistic that said something like uh, by 2050 we could have more plastic by weight than fish in our water. I, are we still on track for that? <laughs> I'd say we're more than on track, and if we don't uh, change our ways rather quickly, we may even be over that number. Uh, and so why is that alarming? You know, plastic to us is something that we use in these little things, these little containers. Uh, it's a very useful uh, material if used properly. We're using a material that's built to last 500 plus years yeah. in items that we use for 30 minutes or less, packaging. Uh, bags, uh, bottles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all ending up in the ocean. Because at the end of the day, that's 99% of our world's living space. And it makes its way into the food chain. So whether you care about recycling or not, you're eating your own garbage at the end of the day. So we're essentially eating plastic. Each and every one of us on this planet, on average, about a credit card size worth of plastic in our bodies at this point. Are you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That is, that is something. Um, we talked a fair amount already about climate change, but of, of those three factors that we've been talking about, how significant is climate change relative to the others? A, a, bigger, a bigger problem? Well, climate change is, is a globally impactful problem, and it's also a globally um, addressable problem, and that's the problem in itself, right? Um, no one sure. lays claim to it because it's not uh, spawning from a specific nation or community. It's because of all of us. It's, right. it's not clearly our... anyone's responsibility. Right. And we've seen this problem with the ocean as well. The ocean is uh, a public good, by and large. Uh, beyond the national borders, the ocean is a free-for-all. And no one takes claim to the responsibilities uh, that everyone wants to benefit from it but no one is following the law of the sea, so to speak, by the United Nations. I think it's fair to say that the, our oceans are giving us plenty of warning signs these days. I was really struck by some of the things I've read recently about the manatees starving. What's that yeah. about? Well, that's one of the factors, the end uh, uh, results of problems like climate change and pollution. They're gentle giants, right? They, yeah. In other words, called sea cows. Yeah, <laughs> they I are, know. they're, they, ugliest things on the planet, and they're most cute and cuddly right, things you know, on the I'm planet. I know, I'm not sure that sea cow is a very <laughs> flattering term. They're well, pretty and sweet looking. They're very sweet animals. Uh, they're, uh, they, they mostly keep to themselves. They're actually quite skittish. Uh, and by and large, very passive. And they will forage for uh, kelp at the bottom of the sea, or, or sea lettuce at the bottom of the sea. The problem is those plants are very much affected by climate change related issues. Yeah. So a temperature variation of just a couple of degrees will wipe out entire crops. Uh, additionally, runoff from uh, rivers and streams from land-based sources of pollution will also kill off those sorts of uh, plants. And so the manatees starve. You really see that whole connection there. Another uh, topic we hear a lot about are coral reefs. I think I read that about 75% of them are threatened at this point. Um, I don't know if that's right, but, but tell us why coral reefs are a big deal. Now, these are estimates. 75% yes. uh, are threatened or, or, or dead uh, or anything in between at this point. Uh, some people say 65. Whatever the case, it's the majority of coral reef ecosystems in the world. And that's, again, 
thanks to climate change related issues. The ocean is a wonderful carbon sink. It absorbs a lot of our CO2 and also yeah. produces more than half of the oxygen that we breathe. So every other breath that you've taken in your lifetime is thanks to the ocean. But that chemical exchange also creates things like carbonic acid in our ocean. It creates uh, higher pHs. Uh, it creates um, all sorts of things like temperature variations. And those are what affect a coral reef ecosystem. Now corals are very complex uh, um, communities of animals, right? It's that the polyps on there, that beautiful fleshy yeah. stuff that we see, and then the stony stuff underneath. And difference in pH or more acidic ocean attacks the calcium carbonate structure, that hard stony structure. Additionally, the temperature variations expel the zooxanthellae or the, the polyps that uh, populate these stony structures. And then you have coral bleaching. And then eventually, if that keeps happening, you have dead coral reef ecosystems. And so therefore, imagine a city devoid of foragers, devoid of, of, of restaurants, devoid of uh, hospitals, devoid of anything else, the city dies, the community dies. So that is essentially what you're saying the coral reefs are like to our oceans. When the buildings of the, cor of the coral reef uh, jungle, so to speak, yeah. uh, go by the wayside, so do housing, so do everything that depends on those coral reefs. We are gonna take another break and we'll be back with more. Fabian, in 2014, you lived underwater for 31 days, yeah. uh, even breaking your grandfather's record. Yeah. I mean, what was that like? And what did you miss most about being on land? Well, breaking the record wasn't the point, but we wanted to do a full lunar cycle. And so 31 days was a natural uh, goal. And he had uh, done how many days? He had done 30 days. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the longest mission at Aquarius, the last surviving undersea marine laboratory, um, located nine miles offshore and 20,000 millimeters under the sea. Uh, what were the most difficult things? Um, the food. The food was terrible. Uh, <laughs> I loved being down at the bottom of the sea in a habitat and being based out of that to go do eight to 12 hours of diving a day. Wow. The more difficult things, of course, were uh, things that were mundane. Uh, you kind of lose your sense of taste, mm -hmm. uh, which is a good thing when you're eating basically astronaut or camping food five times a day because yeah. we burn three times as many calories. Yeah, I, and if you're a foodie, <laughs> I imagine that would have been really hard. <laughs> I, I'm French, so I'm a bit of a, a food snob. <laughs> yeah. Fair, okay. And you, you also had to uh, be very careful of your decision-making processes because you're slightly narked. Yeah. You are under three atmospheres of pressure. Uh, and so you had to make sure that your daily decisions weren't going to be potentially dangerous to yourself or someone sure. else. What was the most significant thing you learned in terms of uh, research about protecting our oceans during that time? Well, living in a small, tight-knit community of six people for 31 days, we got to venture off in the coral reef ecosystem like people do for their jobs eight hours a day. And so in the beginning, those ha inhabitants of those coral cities were very afraid of us because we were the alien creatures invading yeah. their space. But over time, they got used to us. And the more that happened, the more we learned about the natural behavior and infrastructure that happens in a coral reef. And so we looked at predator-prey behavior. We looked at the uh, interaction between uh, octopus and mantis shrimp. We, we looked uh, at new technologies that can give us a good eye and view on what happens in the blink of an eye, uh, such as the edrochonic camera. Uh, we were able to look at hydrocarbon pollution and how that's changing the dynamics from hard coral to sponge type systems mm -hmm. in the same ecosystem and how that's affecting the inhabitants. We're looking at cold water upwelling, which is becoming more and more erratic due to climate change related issues and shutting down the metabolism of the entire ecosystem uh, and for greater and greater periods of time and how that affects us on land because that affects sport fishing, that affects uh, our ability to cater to tourism, that affects uh, our entire uh, economic system uh, in places like Florida. I know that you Skyped with a lot of classrooms and other yeah. groups, and, and in many ways this project was also publicity for the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. But generally speaking, do you think that we are doing enough to educate this next generation about what's at stake? We could never do enough to educate the world about our ocean. Many of those people will never get a chance to peek below the blue veneer. So we have an opportunity and a responsibility 
to be able to show its beauty, its fragility, its majesty, and why we are the caretakers beholden to the health of our ocean. So tell me about Proteus. I know that it is your vision for a cutting edge underwater marine laboratory. Right. Uh, what's involved there? Well, I call it the International Space Station of the Sea because although underwater habitats have existed in the past, my grandfather built some of the first ones. There have been about 70 habitats of sorts, but they've been purpose-built, they've been mission-driven, and then they were subsequently scrapped and taken out. Other than Aquarius, there's no other habitat out there. And Aquarius is 400 internal square feet. So for a New Yorker, you could imagine living with six of your favorite roommates in something the size of a studio in Manhattan. Okay, or... yeah, no thank you, but okay. <laughs> So yes. it's a pretty tight space. Yeah, I guess. Very limited in its opportunities to do science and such because you just don't have the physical space. Yeah. Now imagine building something 10 times the size of Aquarius, which is now 35 years old, by the way. Imagine having a modular system which will be future upgradable, so in a sense future-proof, able to cater to the needs of not just today, but the next generation. So you're saying you could update it as, as it kind of, as time you goes along. You can switch out systems, you can switch out sections of, of Proteus. You could look at science that is uh, combating things like uh, uh, climate change, just like a pandemic, right? The chemical compositions that we've been able to just now peek into in Pandora's box of solutions of the ocean are now breeding solutions to combat leukemia, hmm. right, from a deep water coral. Or, um, and that's uh, the kind of research you could do in a place like this. Oh, absolutely. We've been ignoring our chemical soup. We've been ignoring the, the source of life mm -hmm. for way, way too many decades and generations. So what's the timeline on something like that? Well, without giving up everything that's under that blue carpet, <laughs> um, we're looking at the end of 2025 as an installation date. Wow. In so the country of Curacao. Okay, that's pretty soon. Yeah. Fabian, your grandfather famously said, people protect what they love, they love what they understand, and they understand what they are taught. What understanding would you like people to take away from this conversation today? We're all ocean. We're all made of ocean. This is a closed loop system. And whether you live on the ocean front or a thousand miles away, skiing on top of a mountain, you're skiing on the ocean. Without water, we don't exist. We live our first nine plus months of our lives in water. We are uh, evolved from our ocean. And Everything that we benefit from, everything that we cherish, whether we know it or not, everything that we emotionally feel, the, the intangibles, are thanks to a healthy ocean. The way we treat our ocean is the way we treat our future. And by having a healthier ocean, by protecting it the way we protect our kids, by wanting the best for our ocean the way we want the best for our families and our communities, is the way we're gonna get out of the situation we're in now. Powerful words to end our interview. A special thanks to Fabian Cousteau for his time and expertise on this critically important topic. That is our show for today. We're so glad you joined us. Remember, you can always find us on our website and social media. I'm Carol Ann Riddell, in for Barry Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Simply Science. Ba -ba -da -dum -dum -dum. Down, 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 down